Hello and welcome to CRI's tax reform webinar where we're spotlighting some of those tax changes that are impacting individuals and fiduciaries. Before we get started, we're going to do a couple of housekeeping matters. First, the webinar recording will be provided to everyone who registered for this webinar. That will be sent out um, shortly after the, the webinar's conclusion. Also, keep in mind that under the Handouts tab of the GoToWebinar panel, there are some handouts for you to take, take with you. Uh, some of those summarize some of the uh, pertinent points we're going to cover today. Um, everyone's phone line should be muted, so we encourage you to use the Questions tab in the GoToWebinar panel. We'll handle uh, as many questions as we can as part of this presentation. Lastly, we are unable to offer CPE credits for this webinar at this time. We apologize for that. So the, the agenda for today is covering the pertinent points of how uh, the end of year tax reform is going to impact individuals. We'll start out by covering the income tax brackets and how those are different now. Next we'll move into personal exemptions and deductions, letting you know how those are going to be changing going forward. We're also going to cover the investment aspect of how people's way of investing is going to be impacted by tax reform. We'll move into some of the controversial topics um, that are included in the tax reform bill. And lastly, we'll cover just other additional provisions and notes that we've, we've observed in the tax reform. First, I'm going to introduce the panelists for today. My name is Chris Hoffman. I'll be moderating the webinar today. I'm a partner in the Nashville, Tennessee practice and also the tax service line leader for the firm. My family is two young boys, eight and five. Uh, I also have two Boston Terriers. I like to travel to Hilton Head as often as I can, and I like watching uh, football, especially my alma mater, the University of Tennessee. Matt Fazeda is also on the call today. He's a partner in the Destin office. He has a family of three kids, including a pet cat called Mr. Miaugi. He likes following some of his hometown teams, being from the northern Chicago area, the Green Bay Packers and the Chicago Cubs. David White is also on the call today. He, David is from the Tallahassee office. His family includes an eight-year-old daughter, and his hobbies include binge watching on Netflix, uh, any type of exercise, and as well as traveling with friends and family. He also enjoys following his alma mater, Florida State's, and all their athletic events. So now Matt's going to get things kicked off talking about the income tax rates. Thank you, Chris. I have the pleasure of kicking off today's webinar, um, and we're going to just dive into the income tax rates. Under the new tax law, there are still seven tax brackets. However, um, they have been mostly lowered a few percentage points. Um, there's still the 10% bracket. It's the lowest, and the income range, however, has been extended to 19000 and some change for married filing joint, and 9500 and some change for single filers. Uh, under the 2017 rules, these were the the top end for this bracket was $18,650 and $9,325. Um, the old 33% bracket, though, um, has dropped to 32%, and its range actually decreased uh, to a top end of $400,000 for a married filing joint and $200,000 for single filers versus um, $416,700 under the 2017 rules. Under the new law, it seems that this bracket has the, the shortest income range, um, so I don't, I don't think too many people will hang out there. Um, they'll pretty much probably go from 24 to 35 in a lot of cases, um, so that's just something to note. The 35% bracket is still there. It's the same, but the income range has been significantly widened. Um, you'll see that there's a, for man filing joint, um, there's $200,000 spread there from $400,000 to $600,000, and $200,000 to $500,000, so that's $300,000 on the, on the single side. Um, and the top rate now under the new law is 37%, which dropped down um, from 39.6 under the old law. And it starts at $600,000 for marriage filing joint 
and 500 uh, for single filers. Under the old law, um, these started out in the low four, uh, 400 range. So you'll see that um, the takeaway from this slide is the tax brackets are the same, um, or they're still the same amount, but the income ranges have, have widened. Um, so there's a, a lot more uh, room to play within these brackets. Um, other items of note is that um, the new law is now uh, incorporating what's called the chained consumer price index. Um, so uh, as these are indexed for inflation, they're going to be using the chain CPI rather than the old CPI. Um, and using this chain CPI will mean that these uh, rate brackets will rise much slower than they used to. Also, the change of using or the change to using uh, chain CPI um, does not sunset after 2015 like many of the other provisions we're going to discuss today do. Um, also, it, it's important to know that these are just marginal rates. Um, and so there are some instances um, where the, the new rates won't exactly produce a lower marginal rate. Um, for example, uh, a married couple making 415000 in 2017 will have a marginal rate of 33%. That same, couple, that same couple making the same amount in 2018 uh, will have a 35% marginal tax rate. Again, these are marginal rates, not effective rates, um, but that's something to, to be cognizant of. The next slide we're going to go into uh, deals with uh, fiduciary uh, tax rates. Um, these deal mainly with estates and trusts, um, but under the new law, it's also going to incorporate um, the kitty tax situation. There are now four brackets versus five under the old law. The income ranges are pretty much the same, uh, but the 25% and 28% brackets under the 2017 rules have been combined to make what's now the 24% bracket under the new law. So that range there, the $2,550 to $9,150, um, that's a combination of those two brackets under the old law. The 33% um, percent bracket has increased to 35, and the top rate, just like on the um, ordinary rates or the individual rate side, um, is 37% now versus the old uh, 39.6. So um, one of the biggest changes uh, in regards to these rates deals with the kitty tax provision. Under the old law, the under an income of a child uh, was taxed at the parent's tax rate if the parent's rate was higher than that of the child. The new law changes the tax rate uh, from that of the parents to the rates um, seen here on the screen. Uh, so um, in, in the panhandle here when we're doing returns, most of the kitty uh, under an income for, for kids that we see is, is in that zero to 2,500 range. Um, and so in that case, then their tax rate would be 10% versus what would have been their parents' rate, which is probably in the new 24 to 33% rate. Um, uh, so, so this is a good thing. Earned income, however, will, uh, will be taxed at the rates for single filers. Um, so the takeaway on that part is the, the kids will no longer be impacted by their parents' rates. They'll either be taxed here um, probably in the range of 10 to 24 percent um, on their unearned income um, and in the in the single file tax rates which will probably be you know that 10 to 12 percent rate um, in the ordinary on the ordinary side the impact to you it's important to remember that these are just marginal rates they're not, effect, they're not the effective rate you will pay on your tax returns. The actual total tax you will pay is based on an effective, an effective rate that will depend on many factors. Um, David is going to discuss some of those factors next. Take it away, David. Hey, thanks, Matt. So we're going to talk about personal exemptions, standard deductions, and itemized deductions. Um, we're not only going to talk about 
um, where things are now, but we're also going to talk about where they were before in 2017 and um, before the, the tax bill came into effect. Um, so we're, we're going to highlight mainly the, the tweaks and changes and some of the things that are completely changed. Um, and we're going to start off by talking about the personal exemption. So before 2018, the personal exemption was something that for every individual there in any dependence that they had, um, you were entitled to a personal exemption. For 2017, it was $4,050 for each household member, so each dependent. Um, and with the new tax bill, this is actually completely eliminated. Um, so no longer will there be a personal exemption for yourself, your spouse, um, or any children or dependents that you have. Um, however, we're going to talk about kind of the other side of that, which is um, a, an increase to the standard deduction. But So it's important to note, though, that personal exemptions, no more. So balancing that out, though, is a almost doubling of the standard deduction. So we have here on the slide, just so you can kind of visually see it, um, before 2018, so 2017 and prior, um, uh, you were able to have a standard deduction. For 2017, for instance, it was 6,500 for single filers um, and 13,000 for married filing joint. Um, and then starting in 2018, so this year, um, it, it nearly doubles to 12,000 and 24,000 respectively. So that means that for when you file your tax return, depending on which category that you're in, um, it is only beneficial for you to itemize if you exceed that standard deduction amount. Um, so personal exemptions are gone, but there is an increase to the standard deduction. So that's going to benefit a lot of people, um, with an exception that we'll talk about a little bit later in this section, um, but it is an overall increase to um, reduction of taxable income. So moving on down to itemized deductions now, that was really the effect on the standard deduction. Personal exemptions gone, standard deduction nearly doubled, and so now we're focusing on the changes of this new tax bill to itemized deductions. And the first itemized deduction, um, just going on the form, is medical expenses. Um, before 2018, um, there was a recent change where people that could deduct medical expenses if it exceeded only 10% or if it exceeded 10% of their adjusted gross income. Um, and if you were uh, a senior, if you were older, that was likely 7.5%, but you had to exceed that amount to be able to deduct any medical expenses. Well, with the new tax bill, for a temporary period of time, for just 2017 and 2018, is actually the floor, if you will, is actually reverted back down to 7.5%. So if you're choosing to itemize your deductions, if you have medical expenses of insurance, uh, prescription drugs, doctor's visits, medical miles, um, if they exceed more than 7.5% of your income for 27 and 28, 2017 and 2018, um, you can include that as an itemized deduction, the amount of the excess. Um, however, after 2018, so beginning in 2019, it reverts back to 10%. Next, we're going to talk about another um, um, pretty big change um, in itemized deductions. And you've probably seen it on the news. You've probably heard about it. And that is the effect on uh, the tax deduction as part of an itemized deduction. So normally, if you own uh, properties personally or you live in a state that um, uh, pays um, state taxes, you were allowed to accumulate all of those taxes and have an itemized deduction for the sum of all those. So sales tax, state income tax, property taxes, things like that. Well, you can still accumulate them now, but as far as an itemized deduction is concerned, the sum of all of those is capped to $10,000 of deduction. And that's for the years 2018 through 2025. So if you have multiple properties, like a personal home or maybe a second home, or you live in a state that you pay um, income taxes to, um, the combination of all of those, it very well may exceed 10000 but as for an itemized deduction, you can only deduct $10,000. So that is a, a pretty big change that may impact a lot of people that live in um, um, some high-tax states or tax states in general, um, states that tax income, um, and also that may have more than one home or, or, or piece of real property. Um, something to note, though, is that the $10,000 limit that we just talked about, 
that only relates to basically your person, your personal uh, property that you have and your personal income that you have um, as far as state income taxes. It does not relate to for-profit activities. So if you have a Schedule C for a business, if you have a Schedule E for a rental property, or a Schedule F for a farm, for instance, all of those um, different for-profit activities and those types of activities, those are not limited to $10,000. So if you have multiple rental properties that each have, um, you know, pay property taxes or real estate taxes, those can accumulate in excess of $10,000. We're only talking about itemized deductions as part of Schedule A. So that's something that we don't want to, we want to make sure there aren't any misconceptions out there. That this is only for Schedule A itemized deductions. It's not related to, uh, for instance, a rental property. So that might actually make one consider is a piece of property that is maybe has been on the fence for a few years um, of being a, a, a part-time vacation home, but also a rental property. Uh, maybe this might give more um, pieces to the conversation of should it be converted to maybe a bona fide rental property. Um, another change related to property, actually, um, as far as itemized deductions, is for mortgage interest. There are two main areas that were changed pretty significantly um, as it relates to mortgage interest for itemized deductions. The first is that, um, well, prior to 2018 in this new law, you, would, you were able to deduct the mortgage interest on the first $1 million of basically the, the debt it, you took out to buy your home. So if you had a mortgage of a million dollars or a combination of mortgages, uh, first and second home, uh, that, that were a million dollars, um, you could deduct all of the mortgage interest on that um, amount um, that you paid. Um, well, a new law pushes it down to $750,000 um, of the debt that you can deduct the mortgage interest on. So you may very well have debt in excess of that, but you can only deduct the interest on the first seven fifty. dollars That's only... Another thing we want to make sure um, is clear, um, that is only for debt incurred after December 15th, 2017. So if you have debt from before, from the before the tax change, you can still deduct um, the mortgage interest on up to that million dollars. Um, another big change that will maybe give another uh, piece of consideration for if you were to um, take out a home equity loan is that the deduction for the interest paid on a home equity loan, a HELOC, that is now completely suspended. And unlike the mortgage interest question um, where you kind of get grandfathered in if you had it, uh, a loan, um, a mortgage before the tax law change, this one is, this one is immediate. If you, had a more, if you had a HELOC before, you could deduct the interest. If you have a HELOC still, you can't deduct the interest. You can still get a HELOC, you just can't deduct the interest as part of an itemized deduction anymore. So that, that is completely um, changed. Now moving on to charitable contributions, there are uh, just a couple minor tweaks here. Um, one is that there was a slight increase from 50% up to 60% uh, for the contribution based percentage limit, which is basically your, your limitation on how much um, you can deduct in charitable contributions. So before it was 50% of your, your income um, that you could deduct as a charitable contribution, now it's 60%. Um, also something that you've probably seen on the news or you've probably been solicited by your, um, your favorite um, alma mater or sports team before the year came over and uh, before 2017 ended, um, they're probably asking for you to re-up your, um, your booster contribution or something for, to get your tickets um, because they were correct and, and the new law does change so that um, charitable contribution deductions are denied for amounts paid to a college or university in exchange for athletic events seating rights. So you can still pay them, you can still get the tickets, but whereas before 2018, you would have received an 80% deduction of the amount that you paid for, for those, um, those seating rights, now none of that will be considered a charitable contribution. Moving on to the 2% miscellaneous itemized deduction. Um, this will be a pretty easy slide to cover because you can just forget about it. Um, everything on here is, is, has been um, repealed. Um, there is no longer going to be a section where you can deduct um, things like unreimbursed business expenses, employee business expenses that is, investment expenses, tax preparation fees, 
um, and expenses associated with the production or collection of income. So um, th this whole section is, is going to be um, non-existent starting in 2018. Uh, 2017 would, would have been the last year or will be the last year that you can claim those types of expenses. Um, and so kind of like what we talked about with the taxes on a possible rental property, if, if there's a, um, some, some uh, ability to have a character change there, uh, you might want to also think, and it's going to make people consider, well, what type of structure they operate under. If they're an employee and they have a significant amount of unreimbursed employee-related expenses, maybe they have a discussion with an advisor on maybe somehow restructuring that a little bit um, so that they can actually receive a tax benefit for having incurred all those business expenses. Also something that was tweaked a little bit is the um, personal casualty loss deduction. So kind of like in a similar theme that we've had before with some of these itemized deduction changes, you can still have a personal casualty loss if, 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 you, um, if you unfortunately encounter one, um, but from a tax standpoint, you can only um, uh, deduct those losses if they're attributable to a federally declared disaster. So that is a big change because before there was not, you just had to qualify um, as a, had to qualify as a casualty loss. Well, now there is a, um, a bright line test there as far as if it's a casualty loss for tax purposes or not, and that is only if it's related to a federally declared disaster. And the deduction, um, if so, the deduction is still subject to the $100 per casualty um, uh, threshold and 10% of AGI limitation. So the impact overall, um, just to go back to what we had discussed earlier with um, personal exemptions and itemized deductions and standard deductions, um, something to consider is the impact to the average person, the average family, um, it depends as Lots of answers with in our in our tax world um, um, are the answer is it depends. How does this impact you? Um, it depends on, for instance, the size of your family. If you have a, for instance, stip, uh, a typical family of four, in 2017 you would have had um, personal exemptions. Remember the $4,050 per person. You would have had personal exemptions totaling $16,200. And you would have also had a standard deduction of $13,000. That's a total of $29,200. So now, starting in 2018, if you remember, personal exemptions are gone, and the standard deduction is increased. So the standard deduction for that same family of four would be $24,000. Now that's $5,200 less of a offset to income than before the tax law change. So that's just something interesting to note um, where, where it does depend on your family size if, if someone is, is used to taking the standard deduction. Um, but that does have to be taken in context, of course, with what Matt just talked about earlier a few uh, section ago, which is the overall change in the tax rates. So I think now we're actually going to have a um, polling question. Chris, if you want to take it away. Thanks, David. For our first polling question, <clears throat> we're going to ask people, now that you've uh, heard about some of the changes in itemized deductions and personal exemptions, do you think those changes will be beneficial to you and your family? First option is yes, I, I think I'll come out ahead. Second option is no, I think I'm on the losing end of this deal. Third option is undecided, this is all just too confusing. Um, while we give people a moment to uh, register their vote, we've had a couple of questions come in. Um, I think one uh, that you can handle, David, is uh, when you're covering the health and medical expense itemized deduction, um, can you clarify that whether health insurance would be included in that itemized deduction? Sure, um, that's a great question. Um, and. Um, Kind of like what I mentioned before, the answer is it depends. Um, it, it depends on if that is included um, as part of, for instance, a cafeteria plan where your employer might um, um, allow you to pay for your health insurance and then it doesn't get included in your taxable income. So um, if that is the case, which for most people that are employed that have health insurance to insurance their employer, um, that is generally the case. Um, and in that um, instance, it would not be an additional item to, um, for medical expenses to, to accumulate up to maybe that 7.5%. 
But if it's something other than that, if you actually have independent health insurance that you pay for, um, ex, you know, um, uh, separate from um, any employer that you have, or if you're retired and things like that, um, absolutely, that does get included. The premiums that you pay for medical, dental, um, even long-term care insurance um, are, are um, considered medical expenses, and you can accumulate all of those up, prescription drug costs, everything, um, and co-pays, and if they exceed that 7.5% for 2017 or 2018, you can deduct the amount in excess. Great. Thanks, David. I'll go ahead and close the poll now and share those results. Overall, the, uh, the audience today thinks they're going to be on the losing end with about half of the people saying uh, they, they think they'll get less uh, deductions under the new rules. Um, almost a third think they'll come out ahead. And everyone else is still undecided, um, still thinking through things. The next up is uh, Matt, who's going to cover uh, how the investment uh, aspect may be changing under the new tax reform. All right, thank you, Chris. So the, we're going to just dive into uh, capital gains and qualified dividends. Um, the taxing of capital gains and qualified dividends did not change under the new law. However, the income levels at which the 15% rate and 20% rate um, were altered. The 15% rate now starts at $77,200 for man filing joint and $38,600 uh, for single filers. And so um, any amounts or any gains or qualified dividends uh, below um, those two amounts uh, will have a rate of zero, um, so that's uh, quite a bit of playing room uh, to get the zero percent rate. Um, the 20 percent tax rate kicks in at uh, 4,000 or uh, 478,900, so essentially uh, $479,000 for joint filers and essentially uh, 425,800 for single filers. So. Um, quite an increase um, in terms of uh, when that 20% kicks in. And, and so, I, you know, I think for investments, capital gains, qualified dividends, um, that 15% uh, that rate is, uh, is still pretty solid. It is important to note that the net investment income tax of um, the 3.8% still applies to net investment income uh, when your AGI exceeds uh, 200000 if you're a single filer. Uh, 250,000 if you're a joint filer, and 125,000 um, for a married filing uh, single. So now we're going to jump into what a lot of people on the on the webinar probably want to hear about is pass through businesses. Uh, this is one of the hottest topics of the new tax reform pass-through businesses um, and how the income uh, will actually be taxed. Um, over the next few slides, we're going to discuss the mechanics of this change, um, but our perspective will be somewhat uh, at a surface level. Tomorrow uh, in the business webinar, um, this topic uh, will be discussed in a little more depth. Um, so today we're just trying to um, see what's changed, um, kind of what are the, the, the surface mechanics are. Um, and so you all uh, can kind of get an idea of, of how this is going to impact you um, at an individual level. So without further ado, um, pass-through entities uh, will not be taxed um, at the 21% rate under the new law like um, the C corporations are. Um, they'll still be taxed at the individual rates of the owners, um, but the new law adds a deduction equal to 20% of domestic qualified business income, which is, uh, you'll be hearing it referred to as QBI. Um, the domestic part of that means uh, essentially U.S.-based or tied to U.S. operations, um, which the majority of the folks on this call, you know, have that, but um, some people do play in the international field, um, so that could have an impact there. The amount of the deduction, however, will be determined on several factors. Um, that will be highlighted um, over the course of these next few slides. Additionally, the new law adopts a limitation on excess business losses, um, which a lot of people on the, on the webinar today um, know as net operating losses. Um, 
starting uh, with 2018, um, excess business losses for, of 500,000 and 250,000 uh, for single filers, so that's 500 for joint filers, 250,000 for all other taxpayers, um, will be the, the cap on, on that limitation. Um, so if you have a net operating loss um, in excess of say, um, so 600,000, um, you'll only be able to take 500 in the current year, that additional 100,000 will be carried forward to the next year. Um, under the old NOL rules, um, you know, you could carry it back two years, carry it forward 20 years, um, but under the new law, starting with uh, 2018 losses, the, um, the amount of the, that excess will be limited to 500 and, and 250. The next slide, we're going to be discussing um, just the, uh, the pass-through effect and what uh, QBI is actually referred to. So the, the QBI, uh, the items are the income, gain, deduction, and loss with respect to the taxpayers' qualified trades or businesses. Um, the deduction is granted up to 20%. Um, it's important to note, though, that this is not what we call a four AGI deduction. Um, so, you, you know, on your page one of your 1040, um, there's that section at the bottom um, before your AGI is calculated, and those are reductions to your to your income, and we call those four AGI deductions. Uh, well, this 20% deduction is not one of those. Um, you know, some of those deductions that are, you know, self-employed health insurance. Um, the self-employed retirement contributions, those are for AGI deductions. Um, this uh, max of 20% will not be. It's just strictly going to be um, a reduction of the taxable income before your ta tax is assessed. It's also worth noting that this 20% deduction does not reduce uh, self-employment income. Um, so it, it, it's not going for the sole proprietors out there. Um, it's not going to help reduce the, um, the self-employment income. This is strictly um, on the regular federal tax. Um, and so it, it's not going to benefit that part. It is worth noting, though, that this um, deduction applies to uh, the qualified income from partnerships, S-corporations, and sole proprietorships. So we're just talking about the self-employed income and the reduction there. It doesn't help there, but it does help reduce um, the, the income for, for the Schedule C's out there. Um, so that's, that's a highlight uh, to note. Um, we'll also be discussing a uh, transition to this next slide that there is a, um, a designation that uh, for additional limitations. Um, this, uh, the ability to take this deduction kind of divides um, kind of goes, uh, takes a line. And so there's all other trades or businesses, and then there's going to be what's focused on as specified service trader businesses. And in, in these next few slides, we're going to kind of dive into what those uh, service, uh, specified service trader businesses are. Um, for those that fall into that, um, there's going to be some limitations. Um, initially, on this next slide, um, we're going to talk about we're just going to essentially uh, start slow. And so um, it doesn't matter uh, where you fall. If the, um, if the business, if the, if the taxpayer's income uh, for, that, for their trade or business, um, and, it, and it's each one, um, it's important to know that this isn't, you don't aggregate uh, the income amounts from all of your activities. Um, so if you have uh, you know two or more activities, you're going to look at this on a uh, per entity basis. And so um, it's the the simple part of it is is that if your income per entity is below 315,000, if you're a joint filer, 157.5 if you're all others, that there's no you're not subject to any limitation, regardless of whether you're a specified trader business or um, or anything else. You're going to get the max of the 20% deduction on the amount. So if you're a, if you're um, get a K1 from an S corporation and it's $300,000, then you're 
then you're going to get a deduction for sixty thousand dollars and so that's important to note um, so that's the simplest as we get into this it's a it becomes a little bit of a complex calculation but it's important to have in your head 157.5 if I'm a single or other filer 315,000 if if I'm a joint filer if I'm below that then I get the 20% deduction so we talked about the excluded group so to speak it, they're not technically excluded it's just that um, you know we were just the Again, it's important to keep in your mind the 315,000 and the 157.5 because after you get above those amounts, um, that's when we, what I like to call the phase in, phase out occurs. And so the the phase out is if you're part of this excluded group, which is um, specified uh, uh, specified service trader businesses, and that let's define that. So specified service trader businesses means any trader business activity involving the performance of services in the fields of health, law, accounting, actuarial services, or actuarial sciences, performing arts, consulting, athletics, financial services, etc. cetera. Um, it's any trader business where the principal asset of such trader business is the reputation or skill of one or more of its employees. So on this slide, you'll see that there's doctors, there's lawyers, accountants, consultants, athletes, um, it's insurance brokers, um, realtors, um, all those, their main asset is their skill and reputation. That's what drives their businesses. And so if you fall into that bucket, then if your business income is greater than 315000 for joint, 157500 for a single filer, then you're going to incorporate, start incorporating the phase out. And that incurs over the next $100,000. So from, we'll just take a joint filer, from $315,100 to $415,000, your deduction, that 20% deduction is going to start to phase out until you get to four hundred fifteen. dollars Once you hit four hundred fifteen, dollars you're going to be no longer eligible for any percentage of that deduction. That's, now again, this is strictly for the specified service trader businesses. If you're in any under, other industry, manufacturing, um, or anything like that, then what we are going to call is call this the phase in. And so at $315,001, um, if you're in any other industry, then the phase in is going to deal with um, essentially W-2 limitations, which falls on this next slide. Whoops. So down at the bottom here, you'll see where it starts talking about 50% of W-2 wages from qualified uh, businesses or 25% of W-2 wages plus 2.5% of the unadjusted basis. And that 2.5% of unadjusted basis deals with fixed assets. So in each one of the businesses where there's fixed assets, it's the unadjusted basis of those assets plays into the calculation um, and so again uh, this 50% uh, 25% 2.5% applies to specified service trader businesses in in calculating the phase out for all other industries it's just a phase in of essentially reducing the 20% to say an 18% or 15% deduction but for the what we'll call other trader businesses, it, this deduction doesn't phase out. It just merely reduces depending upon the 50% of W-2 wages or 25% of W-2 wages plus 2.5%. Uh, and, and the calculation just looks at which one's uh, greater. And so out of that 50 and 25, whichever one's greater will be used then to compare against the 20% uh, the, the max, and then it's the lesser of those two. Um, so that's about as deep as we're going to get on that calc. They'll discuss it more tomorrow, um, but that's just important to note. So think of whether so two so three things to consider: the um, am I making three hundred fifteen thousand or less, or one hundred fifty seven five or less? 
um, am I a specified service trader business? And then will this deduction phase out or will it just merely um, reduce depending upon um, the 50%, 25% calculation? And um, again, as, as it gets more in depth, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's important just to, to kind of keep those things in mind. Um, one item of note as well is that there's two, uh, there's two groups, two service groups that got excluded from being excluded, so to speak. Architects and engineers um, had better lobbyists than the rest of us, and so they're part of the other industry group. They are not part of the specified service group. So if you're an architect or engineer, um, you don't have to worry about it phasing out. It's just a matter of phasing in uh, the limitation. Just uh, to wrap up the investment part, um, uh, carried interest tax rates, um, these still are taxed at capital gains, um, but the holding period has been extended or increased to three years um, versus two. The old way was two, now it's just three years. So less than three years, it's going to be short-term rates. More than three years, it's going to be long-term rates. So the impact to you. Everyone take a deep breath and just kind of let it mull over a little bit. So, but the impact to you is that for pass-through business owners, consider whether your business income will be lower than 315 Marin Filing and Joint, 157.5 single. If you're below that, then forget about what I just said, all that I just said. You'll, be, you'll qualify regardless of whether, what industry you're in. You'll qualify for the 20% deduction. So if you're less than 315, 175, you're going to be in good shape to take the full 20% deduction. As it increases above 315 and 157.5, um, we encourage you to reach out to your CI professional um, to help you navigate and calculate the deduction so um, you don't miss out on anything. An example is that, you know, a married attorney um, who makes uh, 300000 from a sole proprietor law firm. Um, the law firm has no employees and doesn't pay any W-2 wages, so it's strictly just the $300,000 of income. Um, he's in a, he's a specified uh, service trader business, um, but that $300,000 is below the three hundred fifteen threshold. So he'll receive a full deduction of $60,000, which is 20% of the $300,000. Now, if his income was uh, $415,000, then or five hundred thousand or whatever it may be, um, and still uh, no employees, no W two wages, and he is a uh, again specified uh, service trader business, um, but he will be unable to take any of the deduction because his income now exceeds the four hundred fifteen phase out. Um, someone else, um, if they were uh, if not in a specified service trader business, and say they made uh, 350,000, then that 20% calc or the 50% calc on wages paid, 25% calc, that would need to come into play. So again, just keep those three things in mind. Um, and if you need help, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and, and we'll be happy uh, to help you. I think we have a polling question next. Yes. Thank you, Matt. So our next <clears throat> polling question deals with that pass-through deduction that Matt just covered. Do you anticipate the pass-through deduction to be cumbersome to you? First option is no, I'm under those income thresholds, not going to be a big deal. Second option is yes, I'm higher than the thresholds, so it will be cumbersome. And third option is I it definitely will be cumbersome and my head is still spinning. Well, I'll give everyone a moment to answer the polling question. Uh, we've got uh, many questions coming in. We'll, we'll try and get to as many of these questions as we can. Um, this one is for you, Matt. It's dealing with that excess business loss you covered uh, the first part of your, your section. I want you to go ahead and um, explain for the $500,000 max what happens if you have a uh, business loss in excess of the 500000 what, what happens to that? Okay, great. 
Um, so it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you get to take a max of five hundred thousand. Uh, so again, if you know if you're uh, if you have excess of your loss, if you if your income is five hundred, uh, you know, and you have six hundred thousand of a loss, um, you're going to have an additional hundred thousand left over, and that's just carried over. It's carried over to the next year. So you're not going to lose it. This isn't a matter of losing um, any of that. It's just going to carry over um, to the next year. Um, under the old rules, um, I believe the NOL, you would carry, like I said, you'd carry it back two years, carry it for 20. Um, with this current uh, law, the uh, that excess can be carried forward indefinitely. Um, so you don't lose out on any of the deduction. It's just limited to the 500 for joint. 250 for single uh, in the current year. Thanks, Matt. I think that clarifies things. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll now and share those results. A little over half of the people um, don't think it's going to be cumbersome as they, they're uh, kind of fall underneath those um, 315 thresholds that Matt mentioned. Uh, almost a quarter says, yes, it will be cumbersome because they're higher than the th those income thresholds. And the last quarter says, definitely, my head is still spinning. Um, and for, for those people whose head's still spinning, as Matt said, feel free to reach out to your local CRI professional where we're, we're happy to help you think through these things. So now I'm going to hand it off to David, who's going to cover some of the more controversial topics um, that were passed as part of tax reform. <clears throat> Thanks, um, Chris and Matt, for um, for all of that. Um, yes, now we're going to cover some topics that are a little bit more controversial in in a couple senses. Either one, either by their just very nature, um, or also because they were controversial when the law was actually being constructed. So you probably heard a lot about reconciliation um, and that process between the Senate and the House versions. Well. We're going to talk about a few pretty significant examples of um, some disagreements between the House and the Senate and ultimately where it ended up um, in the actual bill. And spoiler alert, um, it is actually that the Senate won out on most of those changes. Uh, but we'll talk about that in a second. Um, the first is going to be um, the AMT, the Alternative Minimum Tax. And um, as we can see here, I, we have the pre-2018, so before the new tax law, and then we have the new tax law, um, 2018 through 2025, um, the exemptions and the phase-outs for the AMT. Um, this was controversial because the House actually wanted to, as you might have heard, they wanted to actually repeal AMT altogether, so in its entirety. Um, and the Senate bill only wanted a modest increase over the existing AMT phase-outs, um, and exemptions. Um, ultimately, compromise was reached, and it was settled to drastically increase the AMT phase-outs, um, but not repeal it in its entirety. As you can see here, um, for the most part, um, single filers, married filing joint, married filing separate, they all, um, all of the exemptions and phase-outs increase, um, and phase-outs especially. Um, the, the one exception is AMT uh, for trusts in estates. That only just marginally increased. So that's just something interesting to take away. In addition, um, the one of the changes is um, with the ACA, um, Affordable Care Act Individual Mandate Penalty, um, the new tax law has eliminated the ACA penalty, but only beginning in 2019. So this will actually stay in uh, effect for the 2017-2018 tax years. Um, so this was controversial because um, it was presumed that the, um, the removal of this penalty um, would cause a lot of younger people, healthier people, um, to exit out of the markets and then potentially uh, de destabilize um, and increase the costs of um, insurance for um, the remaining higher risk people. That is, um, well, is, is left to be seen, um, but in the meantime, what we do know is that for 2018 uh, and 2017, uh, the penalty is still in effect, and uh, beginning in 2019, there will be no more ACA individual mandate penalty. Um, however, the um, also coming through from the Affordable Care Act, uh, what remains unchanged are the two taxes. Matt mentioned one of them before, which is the net investment income tax um, of 3.8%. 
that's still in effect, so that did not go away. And the additional Medicare tax on employee wages or, or in, on income, earned income above a certain amount, um, that remains in effect as well. Um, another difference between the Senate and the House bills was uh, related to the estate tax. Um, similar to AMT, the House wanted to kill the estate tax altogether. They wanted it completely repealed. Um, and ultimately, the Senate wanted to kind of walk that back a little bit and not remove it in its entirety. Well, that's actually what ended up happening. Um, the Senate ultimately prevailed in that um, uh, that discussion, and um, the, the the new law basically doubles the estate and gift tax exclusion. Um, so now that um, uh, now the exclusion is eleven million dollars for an individual. You can leave that to your heirs without any um, estate taxes. Um, and of course, for a married couple, that would then mean twenty-two million dollars um, that could that could move on uh, before any estate tax is incurred. Um, something that's also interesting is that that doubling doesn't come with a cost to the step-up in basis allowance. Where when someone passes away, um, whether they're at that eleven or twenty-two million or, or or significantly under, if they just pass away, when someone inherits something, um, a stock or a piece of property of any kind. Um, their basis in that property gets stepped up to the value at the date of death, um, which is a considerable benefit for people that inherit things um, so that they don't have to pay tax on any, um, any potentially significant gain if they were to then liquidate it. Um, so how does this impact you? Well, a couple of the, the, the main takeaways here um, is that the net investment income tax is still in effect. So capital gains rates, um, yes, stay where they are. Well, in addition to that, as Matt mentioned, um, the net investment income tax is, is, is still in effect as well. So if you are single and have over $200,000 of income, or if you are married, filing joint, and have over two fifty, dollars and you have net income from um, you know, dividends, interest income, capital gains, the markets have been going bananas recently, so that's uh, people have been realizing a lot of capital gains well, then you're going to have an additional 3.8% um, uh, net investment income tax um, if you are above those income thresholds. Also, the IRS um, um, has actually come out and announced that um, the, Affordable Care, the Affordable Care Act individual mandate penalty, um, they're going to be looking for it in 2017 and 2018. So they've actually said that taxpayers need to report their health care coverage over those two years. Um, um, and potentially pay the penalty. So it, just because the law has changed, so it's being removed in 2019, um, does not mean that they're not going to be looking for it now. It's actually quite the opposite. They're going It's on their radar. They're going to be looking for that. Um, that's all we have on this topic. Chris, I think we have another poll question up next. Is that right? Yes, we do, David. Thank you. This is the last poll question for today uh, <clears throat> covers the estate tax doubling or the, sorry, the estate exclusion doubling, how do you see that impacting your estate planning strategy? Uh, first option is, um, I don't think it's going to impact me too much. I'm still on track. Second option is, yeah, I do need to go back and review those estate planning documents. And last option is, what estate planning strategy? So while we give everyone a couple of minutes to uh, register their polling results, um, I'll take another question that has come in, and this one will be for you, Matt. It has to do with that pass-through deduction. If someone owns a S-Corp and they are receiving a salary from that S-Corp, how would we recommend that they approach their taking a salary out of the S-Corp in uh, thinking through the pass-through deduction? Um, good question. So. With calculating that pass-through deduction, the reasonable compensation uh, that an owner takes out um, is uh, not included in the calculation, um, so uh, it's kind of backed out um, to to calculate that. So it really is just going to be a matter of uh, determining one, uh, you know, again, reasonable compensation, but also uh, what benefits you best and, and what's the proper salary to take so that you can maximize the deduction. Thanks, Matt. Uh, yeah, those reasonable comp rules, uh, not necessarily new under the tax reform, but uh, some we have to keep in mind. Um, obviously, that, that S Corp K-1 <clears throat> could potentially generate a pass-through deduction, um, but, we, but we can't 
um, we we can't avoid um, paying our owners altogether, and we still have to pay them a reasonable comp. I'm going to close the polling question now and share those results. 62% uh, of the people still feel like they're on track. Um, another 16% is going to go back to reviewing their estate planning documents, and about a quarter says what estate planning strategy. So uh, for that last last group of people, I do encourage you to reach out to your CRI office. We can we can help you think through those estate planning strategies. So now I'm going to hand it back to David, who's going to wrap up with some of the additional provisions and notes. Thanks, Chris. Um, yes, we're going to talk just a you know, you know any one of these subjects we could probably talk um, all day about and get into lots and lots of details, especially on some of the things that Matt was covering. Um, but we do want to just hit a few more highlights, and um, those are that um, the child tax credit um, has been enhanced. It's been increased up to $2,000 per child under the age of 17, um, $500 per non-dependent child, or non-child dependent, rather. Um, also, Social Security numbers are required for the uh, refundable portion of the credit. And the phase-out threshold has been increased to um, $200,000 for married, married filing separate and $400,000 for married filing joint. So ultimately, child tax credit has been enhanced. Um, also, alimony is undone. The, um, this could probably have also been, been mentioned in some of the, in the controversial topic section, uh, but the inclusion into income for the recipient of alimony is removed no longer. And the deduction for alimony paid is no longer as well. And that, however, is only for um, agreements, um, separation agreements or divorce agreements after the end of this current year, so 28, 2018. So December 31st, 2018, after that um, is when this new change uh, takes place. So if you have an agreement and it's in, uh, with alimony, uh, from before that, it is going to be under the standard procedures that, that you've been following. So person who receives alimony, it's considered income. Uh, person who pays it, it's a deduction. That remains unchanged. Um, however, going forward in 2019, so this time next year, any of those um, uh, scenarios, alimony might still be in place um, as part of that agreement, but it is no longer from a tax position standpoint. It's basically um, a moot point. Um, also, Roth recharacterizations are eliminated. Uh, what, that means, what that means is you can still um, convert monies into a Roth account, so from a traditional account into a Roth account, um, but what has been eliminated is the ability to uh, basically undo that. So before you were allowed to convert to a Roth and you could think about it and you would still have some time uh, to maybe unwind that transaction and kind of make it go away and pretend it never happened. Um, now, once you do it, it's done. You can't, you can't go back and change it. So that's something to uh, make sure that you uh, focus on and may only do uh, maybe in, in, in baby steps if, you, if you're cautious about it um, so that you know that you know, if, if you do it, you, you, um, you're not going to have a second chance to, uh, to undo it. Um, also, Section 199 DPAD deduction. DPAD stands for uh, Domestic Production Activities Deduction, which basically means making stuff in the U.S. And if you do that, you were previously allowed a deduction on your tax return uh, for as a percentage of the profits that you make, made from uh, producing things, making things in the U.S. Um, that has now been completely removed. So if you own a construction company or a manufacturing company or anything like, anything like that, um, that DPAD deduction is, is no longer going to be allowed. Um, we're also going to talk about um, the Section 529 plan um, has been expanded. We're going to talk about that a little bit more right now. Um, that's something I wanted to mention because that is, um, it is something that um, might impact some people that have um, elementary and high school educational expenses for their children. Uh, whereas before, you could only um, have a plan for basically college costs, secondary education costs. Now, funds starting in 2018, this, this year, funds can be used for elementary and high school education costs as well. So in 2018, you can use up to $10,000 from a 529 for elementary, high school, or, of course, secondary um, education costs as well. 
Um, 529 plan um, contributions also qualify for the $15,000 annual gift tax exclusion. So if you have any relatives that were wanting to make gifts to any children, um, and also as part of that, um, because it has been expanded so much in terms of what the funds can be used for, again, not just college, but elementary or high school, um, this is definitely something we recommend considering is opening or continuing to fund or maximizing um, the use of a 529 plan. And if you live in a state um, that is an income tax state, then it's also important to note that over 30 states and also Washington, D.C., uh, give a full or partial income tax deduction for contributions that are made into the state's 529 plan. Uh, for instance, Michigan, I know, offers up to $10,000 of a 529 um, deduction uh, for contributions made to their plan if you live in that state and pay tax in that state. Um, so that's just something to know. So if you haven't considered it before, um, you might have had some reasons not to if, if it wasn't um, applicable to you. Um, but now if you have um, a, a kid that has any um, elementary or high school education costs, uh, like tuition, um, then the 529 is, is back on the table as something to talk about. Um, Chris, I think now we have, is that our last polling question? No, we've actually wrapped up the polling questions, David. Uh, now we're okay. just going to wrap up the, <clears throat> the webinar. I appreciate everyone's attendance. I would encourage you to check out uh, CRI's website, um, the web address shown here. Uh, has specific tax reform uh, content specific to individuals. So we have graphics, we have articles, um, things you can download. So please check out that website. It's uh, it's constantly being updated uh, with uh, with new stuff as we continue to delve deeper into the tax reform. Another option on our website is this schedule an appointment uh, button. So if you do have questions, I know we, we've had a lot of great questions come in during the webinar. Unfortunately, we're running a little bit long, so we're not going to be able to get to all these questions. But I would encourage you, if you have a question, go to our website. Uh, it's listed here. Uh, click on the Schedule an Appointment button. It'll ask you uh, what a convenient time is for you and which uh, CRI office would be most convenient for you. And then a CRI professional will actually reach out to you, uh, schedule that appointment, and uh, get you the answers that you need. So again, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Um, I hope this has provided some good, good information for you to start thinking about as how tax reform may impact you personally. Um, and you know, please feel free to reach out to Carr, Riggs, and Ingram and let us know how we can assist you. Thank you.